Welcome to the AI Chat Podcast. I'm your host, Jaden Schaefer. Today, we are thrilled to have a true innovator in the tech world with us, Jack McCulley. He is one of the co-founders of Oculus VR, the company that revolutionized virtual reality and was acquired by Facebook for $2 billion. Before that, Jack made significant contributions to the USB standard and is the brains behind the iconic guitar and drums for the Guitar Hero series. His career has consistently bridge the gap between cutting edge technology and consumer friendly usability. Welcome to the show today, Jack. Thank you, Jaden. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, the accolades you just sung on my behalf uh, are, thank you. It's not as deserved as, as you put it, but I'm trying to be <laughs> humble here. So here's the thing is like, I've been doing this for 40 years and uh, I, there's a far, this is a vineyard here. Uh, there's a okay. winery. This is my place. And I go to the farmer, like I'm trying to school the guy who does the farm here as a contract farmer on, you know, watering and plants. He goes, I've been doing this for 37 years. I don't need you to tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it's just, you know, it just comes uh, with time, uh, honestly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have a very high level of education, uh, um, courtesy of the taxpayers, um, which has been returned in, in tenfold or whatever. But uh, it's just... Uh, my uh, desire as a person who has been involved with art, um, particularly, um, you know, video games and movies. Yeah. And I worked on feature films too a while ago, but um, it's just, a, it, it just happened out that way. Um, I had no direct, I had never had a plan. As a matter of fact, I didn't even have a retirement or anything like that. Never did. It was always um, equity. And I really I endeavored to find. So, because somebody goes, don't you have a pension? I go, no, <laughs> don't need one now. But so, and my pension is myself, actually. Uh -huh. So, um, and I right now I'm, I uh, I teach at UC Berkeley. Uh, I'm taking a semester off to okay. run this facility here. This is a research facility uh, that I own, and I'm taking a semester off to do this and help run the vineyard. I'm learning a lot about grape growing, which I didn't even want to do. So, yeah. anyhow, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, that yeah. You know, that's a it's a fascinating new project and kind of angle, um, which I would I'd love to dive into a little bit. Uh, something yeah. though I did like have a question about is, so you know you've you've done a lot of things in this tech space. I'd be curious, just like going back to the beginning for you, was this always something that you were interested in, like tech specifically? You know, you mentioned you're an artist, and I, I get like this artistic feel from a lot yeah. of the work you've done. What was yeah. your I guess like you know prior to education, like what was your your goal was this always you know, an interest? I wanted, wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a, 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 a scene designer, a set designer, the painting and drawing. That's what I did. I like to take things apart too and draw them. You know, I didn't really understand what they did, but mm -hmm. uh, but in the process of doing that, I learned about how things are built and how things work, and and so that's just how it started. I I love sci-fi uh, okay. stuff, and I, I spent tons of time drawing. You know. I guess, what are they called? What's the technical term for it? Heroics, which is okay. like Frank Frazetta, you know, guys with spears and, and robots and all kinds of stuff like that. Like, yeah. So it was a natural for me to migrate into um, entertainment um, because I couldn't find, you know, in Hollywood where I worked initially, actually I worked in Southern California on on films. Um, okay. The, the pay sucks. It just is right. not good. And so... I said, I gotta, I gotta make more dough. Um, and cause I wanted cars and stuff like that, how nice house, a pool. And mm -hmm. so I just, I ended up in video games with the pay does not suck in video games pays really well. Mm -hmm. So I just stayed there, but it was because it, because of the salary, you know, it was, I was making a, and I graduated from college from a prestigious university and uh, making 28,000 a year. Ooh. Not very good. Yeah. Especially in California. <laughs> Well, that's, I mean, that was the going rate. I mean, you know, it was, I don't know what it was back then. That's like 18 bucks an hour. So that's what people were getting paid um, uh -huh. down there in LA. And then transitioning into video games, which I had done before, a little bit before that. I had worked on that stuff also, but just transitioning, it, it immediately jumped to $100,000 a year. Wow. 4X, yeah. 4X increase. I said, I'm going to stay here. <laughs> and, uh, and I did. But I had, you know, I had family and stuff to take care of. So it's like, yeah, yeah, go very far. A hundred percent. Yeah, and uh, I definitely feel that you know, sometimes people talk about following their passions, and I a hundred percent believe that there's a way to follow your passions while all also doing what you know takes care of yourself, takes care of your family. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah. I I did hear that you you spent some time um, working in or doing some nuclear kind of in the nuclear field in the U.S. Navy. I'm wondering if you could talk yeah. a little bit about uh, sure. your time there and maybe how that influenced yeah. you. I uh, got a job as a tech electronics technician uh, through the U.S. Navy, and um, I was successful there as a tech. I, you know, I can take the stuff apart, right? It's like mm-hmm. a no-brainer. Could use hand tools and knew all the spectrum of drills and all this stuff. So it's easy work for me. Um, in the process of doing that, I got a scholarship from from the Navy to go to Berkeley. And uh, at the time, we were shorthanded in engineering. It's, engineers are always in demand. Uh, we have to import people from other countries here to fill the void of you know, engineering talent. And it ha- hasn't changed. It was like that in the late 70s. So okay. uh, I got a scholarship. Um, what it was like, um, it, it's fun working on submarines. Um, I worked in nuclear engineering. Um, I wasn't, at, you know, what we did at this base was refueling. We cut a hole in the top of the submarine and I can't get into too much detail of that, but you replace the fuel that's in a nuclear reactor. Okay. So there's all kinds of test reports and stuff that needs to be done. And, and so I just migrated away from tools to more paperwork stuff. Um, and working with an engineering team, this is a real live engineering team, no nuclear engineers, electrical engineers, uh, the engineering department, uh, at the shipyard, wherever. So, uh, upon graduating, um, I didn't want to be there. <laughs> so I, I told them, um, even though I got a thank you for the scholarship, uh, but I, I'm going to go work something or do something else. But that's how I migrated away from that very quickly because I didn't really like it. But okay. It, it was a job and, and, uh, you know, paid my bills and, and I think, you know what I was making back then? I think it was like $4 an hour. We were, okay. That's pretty good wage, <laughs> four yeah. bucks an hour. And I could afford a car rent. So, um, but they paid my, my, uh, my tuition and, and, you know, full scholarship. So I got some cash too, but okay. I had to work there. So that, what it was like, um, it, for me, it wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, I was a young guy and it just seemed like I wasn't creative. Um, doing paperwork. I didn't mind the tool yeah. stuff. That was fun. The paperwork stuff. I didn't didn't want to do that. <laughs> so. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and it seems like that's kind of a a trajectory. I think you've followed in. You know, you you talk about the fact that you didn't necessarily have this like grand plan for everything you've been doing. But I feel like in the way that you followed your passions, and not just because there was an opportunity, right? Like perhaps the nuclear thing had a good scholarship and a good opportunity and whatnot. But you you chose to do what you know really interested you, and I believe following your creativity and your passion is what's going to make you excel the most at what you do. And then you're able to excel. So yeah. you, of course, moved on from this. Um, you talked a little bit about working in Hollywood yeah. and then uh, working in video games. Um, talk to me a, a little bit about, uh, you know, what what got you excited about video games and then ultimately why you decided to, you know, transition away from, from that. Well, I, uh, I, I never really transitioned away from video games. I don't do that anymore because I don't have a job. <laughs> but um, I, I'm retired. I, I, I have a job of teaching and stuff like that. So right, right. work in environmental engineering, electric vehicles and things like that, which I, I, I like. Um, but, you know, uh, when I, like I mentioned, the heroics, they, that's uh-huh. a hard form of art. Like Frank Frazetta, you don't think he is, but he says he's an acrylic painter and he paints these macho guys, so spears and Vikings and stuff like that. I just love that stuff. Uh-huh. So. Uh, I was, I got a job at Kodak Research as a, a sequential logic engineer and programmer. So I was programming um, chipsets and things like that. I could do that too. And writing software, mostly on the Sun workstation. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so they go, well, we got s- some work here on Terminator 2 and Dick Tracy. And are you interested? I go, hell yes. <laughs> you know, that, that. Uh, Terminator is a heroic, you know, kind of a yeah. thing, you know, macho type thing. Yeah, of course, I love that stuff. And um, in, in, so I did that, and it was a success, and it got an Oscar. No, I didn't get an Oscar, but the system did. Uh-huh. ORC produced with, with Kodak. And um, so I, you know, am thrilled with that, of course. Um, that launched me into other things, uh, okay. honestly, because I always had that on my resume now. You know, even though I didn't have a resume, I'd say, I worked on T2 and Dick Tracy and mm-hmm. Edward Scissorhands and these other st- things. And that got my foot in the door for sure because they want to hear about it. You know, In an mm-hmm. interview, if you say something like that, they, don't, they stop talking about transistors and 
resistor stuff, <laughs> that stuff. So um, I would say that that relationship I had with the, my boss uh, at Kodak, um, mm -hmm. who's a great guy, I stayed in touch with the guy for 35 years. He's passed oh, wow. away now. He's, he's an old guy. Okay. He was also he's also a PhD. He's a brilliant, absolutely brilliant guy. Um, he got got me other gigs too. You know that's how it works. I I get one gig and this guy goes, hey, hire that guy. Mm. He's pretty good. He's kind of a jerk sometimes. to hire me. Anyways, <laughs> he hired me, and uh, in and uh, you know that's kind of the way it went down. And Oculus, right? The same uh -huh. thing. Uh, I was at Activision um, for quite some time, and my. Uh, my guy I worked with there, Greg Deutsch, um, calls me and says, hey, there's this guy named Brendan Uribe who wants to come show you something. And I go, what is it? He goes, it's a headset. I go, VR headset. I go, oh, no. Okay. So he comes in, knocks on my door, and I just hit it off with the guy. I really like the guy. He's a okay. great guy. You know? and, and so that's how it was. It's like the product was good. It was cool. But I like the people. If I'm going to work with something and we're going to work 12 or 13 hours in the trenches, which is what it is. It's kind of like long, long, long hours. Yeah. I got to get along with the people. Um, if there's any hint that uh, that won't happen, I won't take the work. And, yeah. Uh, so, so that's how that Oculus kind of went down was because of the, the relationships I had throughout my career. And these, these things I ended up, I ended up working on game controllers and reverse engineering video game PS PlayStation. Uh -huh. PS1 controllers, all kinds of controllers, I ended up reverse engineering those. This gets me a, my foot in the door. And I, I built a mouse, a special mouse. So this gets my foot in the door at Logitech um, working on USB. Uh -huh. And um, so that's how it went down. Just as it was a building process. And, and I was pretty careful about what I chose, sometimes not so careful. Uh -huh. One of your questions today will be about one of those choices. But, uh, but generally, I'm pretty, pretty careful. Uh, who I work with. And if, if there's any hint of politics or anything like that, I'm out of there. I'll split. Mm. I'm not, I'll finish my work, but I'm not going to put up with, you know, a bunch of petty stuff like that. I run okay. into that. It just comes with the territory. The two yeah, for sure. You know, that's just the way it is. Um, I stayed in tech, tech side of stuff mostly, except at Oculus and other places. I was doing more managerial stuff, but uh, I tried to stay in the tech stuff because I have less exposure to politics and okay. backbiting and vindictiveness and other things yep. that I can't stand. I just stay away from that stuff. And so um, it kind of went down that way, just re references. I, I never really had a resume. If they ask me for one, I say I don't have one. Call this guy <laughs> and I call him. I, I don't know. What to, you know, things are a little bit more formal with HR now. Not yeah. back then. I mean, it's just like, you know, we'll try you out. If you don't work, you're, uh, you work out get ready <laughs> so right pretty much pretty much uh you know do or die kind of thing so um back now now i think it's you know uh, with lawyers and stuff it's kind of a little more it's a tough you know tougher mm. to to do that but so that's the way it went down that's that's so yeah. interesting um yeah. i'm so obviously i think this is that's a incredible way to kind of go through your career i think like not having a not having a resume just like kind of going off of reference and people like ultimately at the end of the day that's what a company wants i i really feel like it should be a little bit more like that today where uh sometimes people get hired exclusively for you know the resume and maybe the prestigious school they went to but it's not like project based like what did you actually do what did yeah. you actually accomplish exactly. like and like at the end of the day especially for startups it's like they they need people that have actually done a thing that they can then mm -hmm. carry forward into uh into what they're doing so well um yeah. Were you working at Activision um, bef before, like on the, were you working on that US, on USB before you were doing the Guitar Hero stuff? The USB stuff started in 93, 1993. Okay. Um, and I was living in Oakland, California at the time and working as a con consultant with Logitech. Okay. Some hard, hard I was a consultant. That started in '93. There was no USB because I knew I knew the uh, the BIOS. Uh, without getting into too much detail, the BIOS uh -huh. is the low level boot stuff on a PC uh -huh. causes it to boot. I knew the, the BIOS uh, very well and the software structure of it. Um, primarily got hired for that because I could write drivers and things like mm -hmm. this. Okay. I'm a hardware hardware engineer kind of guy, mixture of things. So that's how I got uh, hired. Now. Uh, Guitar Hero came much later. That came in 2005. 
And okay. um, by that time, I had built up a pretty good skill set. And the, the, the bottom line, uh, Jaden, is speed. You mm. have to get it done fast, um, blazing speed. And uh, mm -hmm. if, it's okay to be slow. I mean, and thorough, that's also good. But mm -hmm. the, when you're trying to get something out the door and get funding and money from investors, speed and a good demo. Mm -hmm. So I had that and I had a vast knowledge base of various consoles and PCs and stuff like this mm -hmm. because I'm interested in it and I like video games. So, so I had all this stuff in place. Um, by the time uh, Guitar Hero recruited me, I'm not a founder of Guitar Hero. It's a really interesting story. I, it would be a great book because the two guys, uh, the two guys that started the company, they're the founders, not uh -huh. brothers. They um, uh, had a video game rental business. And okay. They never, they, what they did is they, they wanted to make a DDR, Dance Dance Revolution dance pad. That came out in 99, uh -huh. Konami Entertainment in Japan. It's a dancing game, a yeah. rhythm game. So the music plays and you step on switches on a flat pad and yeah. dance, right? In the bet, the, the guy's got those videos on YouTube. The guys are really fast at it. Like, uh, I'm not super fast at it, but uh, you know, I've definitely done it. <laughs> These the, they endeavored to write their own rhythm game um, without doing a lot of research into intellectual property. Come to find out, we got sued. Um, oh, they no. hired me. They hired me to work on their dance pad. Okay, I, I fixed some problems with it. Basic, really simple stuff. But uh, based on my ability to work. The kind of work they needed they hired me yeah this is prior to guitar hero uh -huh, okay then uh another guy shows up who they hired as a ceo which was a really really smart move if you don't know how to do something and let your ego go and hire someone who's better than you mm -hmm. that's what you do i hired this guy kelly sumner who's a former ceo of take two which is gt grand theft auto he, this guy comes in he bundles the company up into a package um they start working on a demo game of Guitar Hero using the same game engine from Harmonix Music that they use for the dance pad. It's just porting it over to uh, okay. a, a plastic guitar. The plastic guitars we used were from a Japanese game called Guitar Freaks. So the demo okay. unit that I saw initially at CES in 2005 was a Guitar Freaks guitars and Harmonix Music's port of the dance game that they had written and this was the basis of guitar hero mm -hmm. and kelly's job was to find uh my job was to engineer i engine built the stuff it's like it honestly it was pretty easy i mm -hmm. mean i got a lot of accolades for it, but it's really pretty simple stuff and i already knew how to do it it wouldn't be simple if i you try to teach a layman how to do it but for me i've already been doing that stuff for a long time so okay anyhow uh i saw this at ces and i was like i didn't think much of it I'm like okay you've got You've got costs of goods, you've got hardware, and you're going to bundle this up with a piece of software and sell it. And we have production issues like who is going to build this for us? Like, yeah, it's a challenge. And um, the initial versions of that were built by a company um, called Honeybee in China and migrated out of Honeybee into vast number of contract manufacturers. Here's a great story. This is uh, this is a contract manufacturer located in China and they're a big contract manufacturer. We go there and I look at the place, it's huge. I'm going, and this is Guitar Hero 3, right? Uh -huh. I'm looking around and I'm going, so I said, where's, where are we doing our stuff? And I looked over, looked out the window and there's this huge building. And I go, it's that, it's the size of a football stadium. That was our production facility. Wow. And then, then I was scared. It's like, if I F this up, if I screw up, <laughs> this is big. <laughs> I had no idea, but it was a it was a smash hit, um, and uh, and it surprised me. Um, I, I'm not particularly good at choosing hits and, uh -huh. and, and uh, stuff I like. You know, um, you know, I like Gran Turismo and uh, driving cockpit games. I like that kind of stuff. It was perfect for mm -hmm. Oculus. You know, yeah. Uh, um, rhythm games not my thing, but um, it was a smash hit. Now the guy Kelly Sumner packaged up the business and pitched it to. A bunch of companies, including Electronic Arts, nobody wanted it. Can you imagine Electronic Arts turning that down? Right. Uh, we already had the plastic, the ability to build the plastic little tiny company. Was this company. pre launch or post launch? Like after is a huge hit or before? Um, after Guitar Hero oh, really? launched, it was selling really well. Yeah. And we could, okay. we had to find a partner. And, and so EA, uh, 
uh, was pitched to EA and then pitched because we pitched, we were actually producing and getting this stuff sold and, and stuff. We didn't have distribution. We didn't have marketing. We didn't have that stuff. It's a small company. It was mm -hmm. two brothers and, and me and about 20 other, 25 other people. That was it. Okay. So we found the partners, uh, we found, uh, Activision, um, uh, we had angel investors of people who were private citizens who invest money, maybe a friend or an uncle or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have big investment and, and I don't think that the, those two brothers had big, big cash. They do now <laughs> had big right. cash. So we were strapped with finding someone to, to fund it. And, uh, and thankfully Activision saw what it was and, and, and was able to, uh, see through a lot of the problems like pr production problems and okay. cost of goods and, and all of that and put it in the market and mostly the distribution and marketing. It was everywhere. It was commercials on TV and everywhere. That's all that. That's their horsepower, right? It's mm -hmm. the marketing part of it. Yeah. And so, um, Guitar Hero 1 and Guitar Hero 2 sold well. Guitar Hero 3 uh, did exponentially better. The total number of units is 64 million. Oh my gosh. Uh, it was the first, yeah, first uh, video game franchise to hit 2 billion in sales. 2 billion. Wow. Like, this is 15, 18 years ago. Yeah. So it was the first one. And by then it had grown, you know, and outgrown me. And, you know, it was, it's a huge company. Activision's not a, I'm, I'm not saying it's a huge company, but it's bigger than, than, uh, than Red Octane, which is the two brothers company. Mm -hmm. By that time it had, it had grown so big and I was, it's beyond me to do, you know, that's like me running Apple computers, you know, company. I could right. beyond that. So I, I focused on the inventing part and intellectual property and back to the Oculus story. This is how I met Greg Deutsch who turned me on to Brendan. So I was okay. working in the intellectual property department doing patents. I, I'm an inventor, so I do patents and stuff. And I know how, I know that world pretty well. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how it went down. Um, when it got big like that, as I mentioned previously, I kind of looked around and said, it's, a, you know, not what I really want to do. Um, okay. And I uh, ended up uh, um, getting out of there and taking a break for about two years. I didn't work really. I just did hobby stuff, you know. Had you Spiked made it. like a decent amount from the company growing very big? Like, oh, yeah. had, did you have like, yeah. did you have equity in it or was it just like, you know, your I, salary? I had both. Okay. So this is what I did. I, I had a relationship with a semiconductor provider. I sold pre-programmed chips is what my main business was. I, this goes back a long, long time not into the nineties. I would get a chip and I'd say, I'd call it the PlayStation chip mm -hmm. and it could run a PlayStation controller. It was completely debugged. It, it, it looked exactly like Sony's PlayStation mm -hmm. controller chips at PS one. That's what I did. I sold those and I sold them to mad cats and PDP and Thrustmaster all over Europe. And, and so every time I sold one, they bought it direct from the semiconductor company. And mm -hmm. the commission was paid to, paid to me by the semiconductor company. So they just placed an order. I got a commission check. Okay. Well, so when Guitar Hero came along, it's the same thing. It's like, I'll give you the chip. Um, you know, I was the pay sucked, quite frankly. I paid 60000 or something like that. I, I didn't okay. care about that. All I care about is selling a chip, right? Okay. And, and all of a sudden I'm getting these huge checks in, you know, like I'm talking because as the checks. product is going crazy, you're getting all of the exactly. royalties off of the chips. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. It is, but Activision view of that is that you're eating into our bottom line. Right. You know, that's how they see it. And, uh, it's kind of right. It is. That is true. You know, uh -huh. I am eating into the bottom line, but they knew about it. You know, I told uh -huh. you I get a commission. <laughs> so. Uh, that's how I made money. I also got uh, stock options. I got a nice, generous stock option from Activision when the company was acquired. It was the key um, key person, one of the key people there that, that was in the acquisition. It got me, and I got Charles and Kai, the two brothers, and mm -hmm. Lee, and some other folks that were working there. So, and so that's the way the acquisition was written up. Now, you know what they paid for Guitar Hero? It's like. The, 120 million. Now you hear about the Oculus's $3.2 billion acquisition and they paid 120 million for Guitar Hero. It was a, an enormous hit. So, wow. Yeah. That's not much. Right. Uh -huh, and, yeah. Uh, and now these days it's not much back then it was pretty good. So 
you know, uh, the two brothers uh, wisely invested their earnings on that, and I'm sure okay. they're doing they're doing really well on those guys. But Charles, the uh, is the younger of the two. Uh, Charles and Kai. Charles uh, got me um, a trustee gig at Berkeley. He's also a fellow fellow at UC Berkeley as his oh cool guys, or alumni. You guys still <laughs> so, friends to this day? I, yeah, I would say you know when you work with someone and it's stressful, it, you know they don't call it friendsness. They're not right. your friends. Your friends right. are away from work and your buddies, you know. Yeah. But uh, when you're not working with them, you can be friendly with them. I would put it this the current state of, of our relationship as friendly. And, okay. Uh, I know I know his wife, Charles's wife, Elaine. And, uh, uh, Kai is a little bit more quiet and reserved than Charles. Charles is boisterous. And uh, okay. So Charles is it, Charles is a good guy. He really is. I mean, look what they did for me. I mean, how can I criticize them? Uh, and yeah, yeah. they were always generous with me. They're very generous people. Right? I would say that was the case. Mm -hmm. You know, just didn't think about um, trying to help people out. You know, and uh, and I remember also that it's like they were driving their mom's car. <laughs> 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 They're young guys, right? Like, <laughs> I'm not sure that's exactly true. He was driving a gray Mercedes, and it's like turned out to be his mom's. And but they all kind of live in that same area. They live up in the Los Gatos now. Uh, okay. That area, but. But um, yeah, they're they're good guys, and I, I, you know I have to say every time I pulled out of one of those things, I, I kept to maintain the relationship. I call people, mm -hmm. not so much Oculus guys, but because I'm not working anymore, right? Mm -hmm. right. right. I don't, no one's going to hire me now. I mean, I could, but I'm, I'm not looking for a job. Mm -hmm. But I always call people, like call them and say, "Hey, man, how you doing? What are you guys working on? You know, or something like that." They won't tell uh -huh. us sometimes, but you know, <laughs> I'll tell you, this is what I'm working on. That kind of stuff or let's right. go get lunch go meet him for lunch you know and uh that pays off in spades because you know whatever difficulties you had at working with someone get kind of get softened <laughs> a little bit. right so, right 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 i i would say um you know uh that, that uh uh you know in terms of oculus um it was a good experience for me uh the product um i said publicly in 2019 it's not going anywhere was kind of right, but I'd say that every time. Uh -huh. But it, it was kind of right in some ways. Uh, it has not, um, mostly because you know, Facebook Meta, right, is a social media company, advertising uh -huh. company, sell ads, right. right? They're not a video game company, mm -hmm. and it seems to me the proper thing to do would to be a, buy a big studio mm -hmm. and have them work on the game and stay out of the way. Mm. But th that's not the way it went down, apparently, uh, mm -hmm. and it was very dictatorial and top top-down driven, which doesn't work. i tell you this, yeah. you work in a studio, there's really creative people there, very, and mm -hmm. you just got to get out of the way. You know, mm -hmm. you may not like what they're doing, but you just got to let it go and not say anything. And mm -hmm. That's what I learned. And if you do that, it works much better. And that's not what happened with Horizon Worlds and Meta. It was, it was just a kind of a personal thing, I guess. Or was when you... people. When you'd gotten started with uh, Meta, so you know you took a break after Guitar Hero uh, for a little bit. Um, you know, then you had had someone come in and, and show you the the Oculus. When you gotten started, was it kind of that like small studio vibe? Like, what what kind of attracted you uh, to yeah. actually you know working with them? Yeah. Well, uh, they didn't have a, a office when they first started. It was uh, probably Brennan's house, and okay. we didn't have an office. Uh, those guys work in, I think Palmer was living in a trailer on front of his house. <laughs> that's what I heard. I don't know if that's true. And Nate, uh, Nate Mitchell was working for uh, Autodesk. He wasn't even there until later, he didn't show up until later. So it was very small. Um, uh -huh. And and quite frankly, they relied on me. They were relying on me to, to produce. See, they had a Kickstarter. I don't know uh -huh. what that is. But yeah. They crowd crowdfunded thing. And you just did it to get attention mm -hmm. to the product. And they did a... Nate and Brendan, mostly Nate, did a really beautiful job on it. It was like professionally done. We had a movie crew in. It was filmed in, not here, another place I had. We filmed it. They had a movie crew in. I had all this stuff. And, and then when I saw it, I go, oh, my God, that's very, that's really, really good. And it got a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. And they built the story, um, Palmer Lucky story, based on Oculus. It's a great story. He's an 18-year-old guy, and he's built this thing in his garage and how fantastic it is. Mm -hmm. And that was the whole thing. So you're asking me about the size of the place. Now, if we had proceeded forward with the core team, Mike, mm -hmm. Nate, and some other folks there, myself, Brennan, Palmer, and tried to sell that to a Facebook, 
Mm -hmm. What would you do if you walked into, you know, like a, a dusty shop garage and you saw those people sitting there? It's not impressive. Right. right? Yeah. So there was a lot of hiring done. Key people. Uh, some people really, really uh, high end uh, developers and so forth. We hired really great people. John Carmack and other folks uh, hired. Um, and this gave the impression that we were serious and mm -hmm. we decorated, we bought, we rented at least two floors of a high rise in, in um, Orange County. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'd set up the office. It looked like a game studio, you know, with figurines and graffiti and stuff. I like that stuff too. Yeah, yeah. So it looked like a dev studio. So when you walk in there, let's say you're, uh, I don't know, a guy that runs this social media company called Meta and you see <laughs> that, you know, they're serious. Yeah. And if you, if you're not in the video game world, first thing I want to see, let me see your demo. Let's, let's see your stuff. Right. Yeah. That's the first thing I want. I don't care about other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so we had to uh, have this presentation uh, in order to get someone to be interested in buying the company because mm -hmm. without that, they're just going to see five dorks in our garage, you know, kind of like deal. And it's just, and so again, that's not what I do. I'm the tech guy, the technical yeah. guy in production. It's like I can, I can make stuff. And, and, but I think that that was what really carried it forward uh, and got people to believe it's a, it's a great experience. You put it on and the, the visual part of it is very, very good. Uh -huh. um, there, there's some problems, you know, uh, Jaden with, with uh, VR and primarily yeah. is motion, motion sickness is a big one mm -hmm. and no one's conquered that. I endeavored to try to fix it on my own. I couldn't fix it. Um, without, you know, I, I would need a, a team. It was me and some other people were working on that, but it's mm -hmm. just, it's just, it's challenged with that. Um, it is, uh, it, it's, it's the frontier, uh, that needs to be tackled by, uh, young people, um, uh, in a separated studio away from, uh, headquarters. Yeah. And this is how Activision is set up by the way. Really? Uh, never. Yeah, they, you go to the office. It's just a little. It's a building. It's a nice building and stuff. There's not that many people there. It's mm. not that. It's not big. But okay. The studios, uh, NeverSoft, um, and, and so on, are set up as separate entities, and the Activision mm -hmm. people do not go there. They're a separate thing. It's an artistic endeavor. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. So, that's the successful model. Um, there's different models. EA. I worked at EA also. EA Sports. It's kind of centralized like that. The mocap studio is right on campus in Burnaby, Canada, and so forth. So EA is kind of set up like that. EA Sports, I'm talking about the studio. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. More centralized, but most for the most part, the most successful model is separated uh, okay. model where you let people work creatively. Yeah, that makes 100%. Yeah, be, and that makes so much know. sense because I feel like there's so many incredible ways for companies and for like capitalism, right, whatever, to capitalize on creativity and art like video games and and all sorts of different uh, so, all sorts of different things but so often like you said right if you try to stick this into a headquarters like that's not where creative people thrive and yeah. if you want them to do their best work aka you know what the consumer will like the most what will make the company the most successful like yeah you have to set up the environment uh for them to be able to mm -hmm. to thrive there when facebook was you know interested in oculus had you you'd already kind of created the headset had it launched the first one talk me through yeah. the timeline of what was going on and what you're working on there sure so uh we launched a kickstarter and okay. we gave uh, so the way kickstarter uh so you came on pre-kickstarter yeah i was there okay they filmed the kickstarter video at my other place I knew oh, okay. the book it. yeah they filmed it at my other studio so i didn't have a studio i had one okay so r d center or whatever yeah. Um, so they came in and they, they filmed the Kickstarter video. It went up and we had 90 days to get it finished. This is the first developer kit. Mm -hmm. And that is just uh, a staggering short period of time. Mm -hmm. So I took Palmer's prototype to China and we reversed. He didn't. Palmer got the lenses on eBay for the uh -huh. DK1. He, those were on eBay. He got those on eBay. We didn't have any specs on anything. And uh, uh -huh. it's, it, we got other parts from other people like Mark Bolas at USC gave us some stuff and Reality Labs. But essentially it was a cold, dead cold. The, the strap was from Scott Goggles, you know, like a ski <laughs> goggles. That's where yeah, it came yeah. from. So we cobbled that together and took that over there and had them source the parts and do the tooling. Incidentally, the woman that owns the factory is a very close friend of mine. And she, she, got, she got the Guitar Hero stuff. That was a huge break for her. Okay. Before that, she was doing little game controllers and stuff. She got this huge contract. 
So she owed me, but I took it in there. I go, this is, I had to like, I had to sell it, right? It's like, uh-huh. this is going to change the world. Blah, blah, blah. She looked at it. She goes, okay, let me see. And she put, took off. She goes, how much money you guys got? I go, <laughs> not much. <laughs> she goes, okay, you have to give me half up front. And well, I can make 10,000 of them, but you got to pay me. So we had to scrounge, scrounge up 750K or something like that. Uh, almost a mill. And that kind of the way it went down is very informal, not mm-hmm. like contract sign and lawyers and all that. We didn't do that. We just like kind of hacked our way in. And I like that, by the way. But it wasn't, it didn't go down like that. So DK1, to answer your question, comes along and launches and it sells through like 10,000 uh-huh. gone. We made more sells through. Suddenly we're like, uh, at a, a, it's a small run. It's not very tiny, but uh-huh. we're like 70,000 units and it's still being bought with a subpar sort of performance. It's just a, uh, a couple of people's prototype thing that we reproduced in plastic. Essentially that's uh-huh. what we did. And it was selling really well. And the buzz that it was starting to show up on TV on, uh-huh. on uh, you know, Jimmy Kimmel and all this sort of stuff. And that's Brennan, but, and so we kind of realized that we might be on, that they might be onto something. Um, uh-huh. And, and at least the talent and skill that certain people have, like my boss for marketing and, and getting stuff into people's face. He's so good at that. He's he's a really talented guy. He's also a software engineer. He doesn't do that though. He's you know, he's a show showman. You know. Okay. Kind of gotcha. So, yeah. 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 So he uh, um, he sold seventy thousand, and then so what are we going to do? Well, Vive, the competitor. We have a competitor now in Washington, right? And we had been working with those guys, and they have a a room experience unit, right? Uh-huh. What you can walk around in, which is ultimately what you want. Yeah, yeah. We had a we had a room experience prototype at, at Oculus and we got that from Valve mostly, but we already had kind of had that, but we chose a seated experience like for cockpit games, but we had to eliminate some vestibular sick motion sickness issues. Right. We used a camera and and LEDs on the inside of the headset that you can't see that are like markers that you can you can monitor the position and head and so forth and get Transit translations from side to side with DK1, those kinds of translations aren't handled. They can't be. The technology mm. doesn't exist at DK1 to handle those. But a camera looking at it from the outside, an observer can do that. Okay. So we came we came out with uh, DK2 and DK2 sold 150,000. It's like boom, right? Okay. So the timeline is uh, DK1, and now we have people's attention, and mm-hmm. um, Mark Zuckerberg is interested. And Mark Zuckerberg shows up uh, at uh, the office in Irvine in Orange County, the two story, two stories of a high rise thing. And the sales pitch was on. He was he was like, Brennan can you know could sell you uh, moon dust even though he's not moon dust. <laughs> he the guy. He, he sold he sold it to him, um, and uh, the rest is kind of history. It was on Silicon Valley. They were skewering it. It was and when you're getting skewered on a comedy show, you know you've had an impact. That's great. yeah yeah so that and uh at the same time i'm like looking at this and going you know wh- where are we going with this and then i'm looking at we're going to get acquired by meta i think that's what's going to happen here this right mm-hmm. i knew what was happening right and uh i was in china and I, this is a, a funny story brendan calls me it's like four o'clock in the morning and i go he goes I go, hello i had my iphone 2 or whatever it was he goes, <laughs> he goes uh guess what? I go, what? I said, you woke me up. He goes, we sold the business um, to Facebook. And he goes, he goes, he says something like you have a stack of dollar bills going to the moon or something like that. I don't remember exactly what he said. <laughs> so I said, okay. So I, I hung up and called my wife and I told her, well, what do I do? And, yeah. And she goes, do you, she didn't say, so another friend of mine said, do you think you fit in at Facebook? And I go, no. I like to work at a studio. I mean, I, I like art. That's uh-huh. where I want to be. I don't want to be, uh, you know, moderating uh, people's silly Facebook posts or whatever. I don't think I'd do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like a, a language cop or yeah, yeah. mood cop. So I decided that I, I uh, would uh, look at my exit um, pretty quickly after that. Uh-huh. And and uh, and I went to Brad and I go, hey, man, uh, you know, I don't want to work there. And I, I don't want to work at Facebook. I, I said I would. What would happen to me? I'd probably get fired. <laughs> I'd say something. I probably would. No, I would get fired. But I would probably say something or do something, you know, and, and be unhappy. 
Yeah, I yeah. Be happy, so. And he goes, okay, well, let me talk to him. And he comes back to me, he goes, okay, you can leave. I was like, with your money. Now, most deals like this, you have to stay there for five years. Right, yeah. yeah. And it's risky because if you get fired, that's your competition. You could lose a portion of that. And so I looked at that and I go, well, if I go there and they fired me, I could lose. Why don't I just take it all now? That's kind of uh -huh. what I was thinking at the time. And, and so he granted me that. And 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 the rest, I bet that's eight years ago or something. And uh, 10 years, 10 years ago since we formed the company, uh, coming up on 11. Mm -hmm. And eight years, is that true? Eight years since exit. Yeah, I exited in 2015. You know, when you go to, I go to Facebook and I look around the building three and there's like beanbag chairs on the floor and a desk that you sit across from. So I'm just, <laughs> I don't like that. I mean, I got to look at the guy all day long and, <laughs> and I lay around on beanbag chairs, you know, <laughs> an old man. And I didn't see anyone there that was older than me. I would be the oldest person there. I, uh, maybe the cook. There was a guy in the cafeteria that was like, the chef was cooking, <laughs> cooking their, uh, you know, vegan specials or whatever. And he, he was, uh, he was about my age. I go, man, it's just, I won't fit in here. I can tell, you know, it's just, and what would they do with me? You know, I don't know what they would use me for, you know, they need yeah. a hard ranger here. But, you know, I will say this, the quest, uh, was a fantastic piece of hardware. They did a really mm -hmm. good job on that. And, and it took a long time. But it's really, really good. Now, mm -hmm. it's, uh, is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. But for 350 bucks, it's pretty good. It's I know. That price up. point is hard to beat. Yeah, um, yeah. And I mean, looking at like what, with what we're seeing with Apple coming into the space, do you feel like mm -hmm. that's validating to the idea? What like I would just love – I know you don't have a crystal ball, but like from, yeah. your, from your view of the past, like how do you think Apple's mm -hmm. new headset is going to play into this uh, cool. pricing and all that, you know? Well – uh, I know the people who are running the headset program at Apple. Um, the guy that's running it is entirely competent and okay. a really, really good engineer. He's the VP level guy. Um, and uh, I know him really pretty well. They tried to hire me or recruit me, but uh, I think the problem I faced at Facebook would be the same problem I'd face at Apple. It's just yeah. not for me. So. Yeah. Uh, I think it's great. I think it's expensive. It costs as much as a car. And, and, and then, you know, in, in Mexico, I, I live there a little bit. I got a house there. Um, the wages are low. And, um, but people have a mobile phone. I'm looking at it going, so the phone's $400 and you make 2600 a year. You know, how, how does that work? That's like, that's an expensive item. Well, they have a, a payment plan. Right. And you, you, you pay for the, the hardware as part of your monthly payments and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it kind of works. They can make it work. You know, mm -hmm. they have to hold onto the phone for a long time. But is is the but the utility of a phone is obvious. I mean, yeah. you need one. Yeah. Do you need a, a VR headset um, uh, at the same sort of utility level that you need a phone? I would say no. You know, yeah. VR headsets uh, are uh, for entertainment. Now, granted, the phone is for entertainment too. But mm -hmm. I, I would say that uh, they're they're going to be challenged. Now, Apple is a has got the GDP of Mexico almost. It's, I think that's true. No, I'm yeah. not, don't quote me on that. It's it's the company is three trillion dollar company. It's gonna, yeah. It's gonna yeah. Uh, they, can they afford to have one fail? Yeah, sure. You know, big deal. Try again. Try something else. But whatever they do, they do really well. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think, in my view, their stuff. I don't. I'm not an Apple PC guy. I don't like their computers, but their their phones are great. I don't like Android. I like mm -hmm. Apple. So it's okay. my preference. Uh, whatever they do, they do well, and it's high quality, and it works. I mean, mm -hmm. how, how many times, ask yourself, if you have an Apple, how many times does it reboot or crash? Almost never. Yeah, that's that is true. That's myriad, myriad of applications that they didn't write running. Yeah. It's a testament to the, to the quality of the uh, engineering that went into it. And uh, they've always had a good good engineering there. So, But they can afford to take a hit. Um, can a smaller company uh, afford that kind of a hit? No. Um, let me tell you what I think. If we hadn't been acquired uh -huh. by by Facebook, we would have failed. The company would have folded because really? the cost of goods. Yeah, the cost of goods. We didn't have we didn't have an application for it. Mm. it. We didn't have any games. Then had a couple small things, demo games and stuff like that. But we didn't. So, what were app. people using it for? Like those early, uh, you know, ones they were buying. Well, we had developers. People were writing content around it. Okay. So we got some of those, right? The DK one is developer kit one and developer kit two, uh, CV one, consumer version one, so forth. 
So we had developers uh, that were developing content around it, but there was no major application for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, interesting when I when I got the Quest, when I first got the Quest and put it on, I I, I didn't know. I thought it, the games were kind of a dud. Okay. Uh, you know, they're, they're kind of weird. Um, yeah. It was like a di disco you went into. I mean, what are you supposed to do? What's the strategy? Your game's got to have strategy. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. gotta have there's gotta be a social component. This is the new part of gaming. Like you're playing against people all over the world. But right. what's the goal? What goals do you have? Is it to conquer the hill the, the fort on the hill? Or what what are you trying to do? Or shoot the tanks? Right. There's no goal and I just didn't get it. Um and you have Beat Saber, I mean it's an arcadish game and, and you can play that for twenty minutes, but they don't have a, a, a long term play application. I love the idea of a metaverse. I think that's a uh -huh. really cool idea. You can have your own currency. Yeah. With Roblox, you know, I mean, you can have your own currency. It's a land you can go visit and you can have a, your own lifestyle. You could be better looking than you are. You can have Ferraris, all that stuff. You have to earn them. I think it's a great idea. But the execution, um, because Facebook is not made as not a video game company, uh, it didn't happen. Uh, yeah. And had they had, they had farmed their stuff out to, a dynamic studio bought a studio and gotten the hell out of the way it would have had probably a different outcome if they needed okay. a killer game with it and a creative game uh so they didn't have that and how much visual stuff can you do okay the spaceship blew up and you know, star wars the guy falls out of the spaceship and i right, come on uh, so much of that you can it's like okay I, it's great visuals but we're, what do i do now so uh -huh. that's my take on it um one other thing on that what do you think so it's is like pretty pretty commented on when apple kind of launched their vr headset yeah the thing looks super high end super high quality mm -hmm. apple makes great things so they have that reputation but it was noted that they they didn't mention like games at all in yeah. their headset launch so yeah. do you think that's gonna hold them back like isn't that a big part of adoption of these vr headsets what is what is apple apple's uh okay Apple sells entertainment. They have iTunes. Yeah. And now they're starting to get into feature films. They're, they're getting into content for their hardware. If they could come up with uh, uh, a game or content for it, I don't know what that would be. Some of the, some of the, one of the really good ideas I, I heard, and this was attempted, is like if you wanted to go to a sports venue and you want to sit on like a, a Jets game or something like that, or yeah. Niners, and sit on the 50-yard line, uh -huh. You could sell that ticket to a hundred people uh -huh. and have them put the headset on and watch the game yeah. right there with, with people right next to you, real people. And people are working on this, um, you know, with, with 360 cameras and so forth. They were thinking about this. I think that's a great, uh, I would like to do that. I'd like to go to a yeah. Niners game or that is Jets cool. or something and pay yeah. kids and sit on the 50 yard line. That's great. And pay 20 bucks or 50 bucks or something to watch three hours of football. Yeah, that's something that I would I would enjoy and do. So this is this is the thing is like they just haven't no one has has had the ability to come up with um, a mechanism or enter, entertainment part for 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 a headset. They just haven't been able to do that so far. And this is what's probably holding it back. Mm -hmm. You know, granted, there are vestibular issues also. So this is why a, a game where you walk around and you're wearing the headset doesn't really work very well. Uh -huh. uh, that's one of the main ones. It makes people sick. And yeah. I don't get sick from it. I've been staring at computer screens for 40 years, but a lot of people who don't do that put it on and they go, oh, I, I don't feel well. I feel dizzy. Mm -hmm. you know, right? uh, and so, so anyways, that's, that's my call. And Apple's ability to execute is well known. Uh, their uh -huh. stuff's flawless. And they ask a question. You know, the Apple has an app for the car, right? Apple yeah. car. Uh -huh. Yeah. Why aren't car manufacturers using that? I mean, there's cars everywhere. There are some using it, you know. Yeah. I, ha I have a car with it in it, but uh, they want to sell their own. They want their own content um, yeah. and their own software. And mm -hmm. I heard an interview with, with Ford Motor Company that said, we don't, do, we don't provide hardly any of the software for our cars. It's all third-party stuff. Mm -hmm. It seems to me you'd want to bring that in uh, and put content in the vehicle. Uh, you know, Tesla's pretty much done that successfully. They have games and yeah. stuff you can put in there. Yeah, yeah. But and so this is this is the, the the issue really is that there's not really good content um for VR right now. Um we heard some of my ideas here. Yeah. But um watching a movie at a movie theater sounds good. Um but why aren't we doing that? Uh if it's 
if, if, if it could bring in revenue, people would be doing it. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Quest, Quest sold 120 million headsets. This is what they quoted. Uh -huh. uh, that's pretty good. Yeah. You know, that's, a, that's a lot of them. Yeah, actually, no, a ton uh, of people, especially with the, the cheaper version. I don't know if the Pro did quite as well. Yeah. I heard they kept no. cutting the price and yeah. handing it out at the end. So that's why I'm concerned about Apple, um, just because it seems like, yeah. like that price point that might um, mm -hmm. make it a little bit tricky. Uh, question for you, kind of on the overall landscape in tech right now, based off of you know what you've seen mm -hmm. in the past and today. I feel like we've seen a couple different waves over the last number of years. We've seen kind of, there was like the Web3 crypto wave. There is this whole metaverse wave. Mm -hmm. um different levels of those things have kind of sputtered out or changed mm -hmm. today of course we're seeing mm -hmm. the ai wave where mm -hmm. everyone's integrating ai how would you compare what we're seeing in ai today to some of mm -hmm. these previous kind of like big some people call them bubbles or, or waves or whatever but kind of revolutions mm -hmm. in tech um i will say that no one's quite clearly explained what ai does they know that they can go onto a website and ask it to write a song or tell a story, but no one's been able to explain exactly what it is or what it does. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of it's fear. People are afraid of it. Well, what if it starts interfering with social things? And it mm -hmm. may be already, but you know, this, this is the kind of stuff that people are concerned about. Um, politics, um, you know, people using it for nefarious purposes. Mm -hmm. um, generating stories that aren't true and repeating them in the media over and over again until they become true. This is the, what people are afraid of. Can that, can it be, if you see mid journey, I don't know if you've looked yeah. at the art and stuff. Yeah. Some of that yeah. stuff that is just like, it's like hellish to look at. It's like a nightmare. <laughs> and some of it, some of it's beautiful. Totally. Uh, some yeah. of this, the car, the automobile renders and things that have been done with it are just stunning. So it has two purposes. One, I mean, there's two spectrums. One is very negative things it can do and also very positive things it can do. Uh -huh. I don't believe personally that trying to regulate it, if, if governments try to regulate it, they're going to regulate it in a way which benefits them, mm -hmm. not, the, not the populace. And For this is sure. kind of what, yeah. yeah. So I don't think it's government needs to get involved in that. Uh, it has to be self-regulated. You know, yeah. there has to be uh, some way of self-regulating. So... I'm not sure how that would, would play out exactly, um, but there has to be uh, some mechanism for doing that, and that would have to be intrinsic in the in the provider of the service. Mm -hmm. I think um, Microsoft has uh, Azure One. I think it is a supercomputer that they built. That's the backbone of a lot of the uh, current apps that are out there, um, which utilize AI are using Microsoft stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. basically, it kind of comes out of the cloud, and um, so. You know, I typed in my name one day to see what it said about me. It was like, most of it wasn't true. It was uh -huh. weird. <laughs> so can it be curated to lie about things? I think it can be. And, and then, so what I did was like, like I in injected false information into a Wikipedia page and then okay. it again. Now it's giving me the stuff from the Wikipedia page. So it looks like it goes to Reddit and Wikipedia to get its stuff. So. Um, there's a guy, Wolfram, a guy that did a really good write up on the API um, for that the, used for the most popular um, AI interfaces. Um, and he did a really good job of writing it up and explaining it. I recommend people to go there. So. Okay. Very, yeah, very interesting. Um, I would also be curious to, to hear your thoughts on, you know, so of course we're, we're implementing AI. Do you feel like this is a little bit more perhaps? like hype around AI? Do you think that, that it's, it's as impactful as perhaps we're being told? Do you feel like it is less impactful or more? Like, for example, we have people like, you know, Sam Altman saying, we're going to start doing universal basic income soon because AI is going to essentially replace most jobs. Do you, do you see that being the case in the future? I think if you're a writer or an actor, that would be something you'd need to worry about. I don't know how AI would replace a person who does podcasts, perhaps it could. I mean, you're, you're to be honest, with you, you're very good at this. I, I've been through a couple podcasts, and you obviously have a talent for it. I appreciate um, it. it. There's things it can't do. Uh, can it treat people's medical conditions? Maybe symptomatically, mm -hmm. it could, but it can't do surgery. Right mm -hmm. now, I mean, you can't do that. Um, although they have the you know, surgery robots and so forth. Mm -hmm. A lot it can't drive a Formula One car very well. Uh, mm -hmm. So a lot of things it can't do. Can it write scripts? 
can it write jokes? It can do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But it's kind of, yeah. Can it write songs? Yes, it can write. I wrote a, a, I used a, an AI app I mentioned, but to write a song just to see if it can write. It was pretty good. It was a country western song. Really? So, yeah. You just put, write a song about a puppy and it'll write the song about a puppy. So country western. And uh, so it can do that kind of stuff. Um, I think you're onto something there. I, I don't know that a universal basic income uh, is the answer. Uh, you mm -hmm. think that you just have to reskill yourself. Can AI be a roofer or a plumber? It can't. Can AI fix your car? No, it can't take an engine apart in your car. Can it frame a home? It can't do that. Maybe those will be the high end jobs, you know? Well, yeah. You know, labor, you know? It can't really do labor. It can do intellectual stuff, probably some, some stuff, but it can't do certain things and mm -hmm. now anyway. So, so, okay. So I, and I want to, I want to dive a little deeper on that. Um, so for example, for the podcast, I actually, prior to starting this podcast actually made probably like 10 podcasts, which were completely written by and spoken by AI and they <laughs> became incredibly popular. But I also um, realized that those podcasts had a hard time converting listeners to like followers. And so when I started this podcast, of course I had that background and I'm like, oh, maybe I'll do an AI podcast and just like make a clone of my voice and then use yeah. that. But I came to the conclusion that you actually need like a physical person that makes mistakes, sure. that says, um, that messes up. Like as AI becomes more prevalent and all, like everywhere, people aren't gonna want to listen to what is like a, like a perfect, like they want mistakes. They want like a little yeah. human error in it. So anyways, that's with the, the podcast thing. But my, my question on like plumbers and roofers, this is something that I'm like a little concerned about. So Tesla right now, of course, they're making their Tesla humanoid robot. There's others. What if like, do you, do you see like that as a viable solution or option in the future where like, let's say there's a Tesla humanoid robot that eventually is trained on AI. So it's as fluid as a human then it just like, you know, you get maybe like an electrician or a plumber to wear like a full body suit for like a year while they're doing all their electrical and plumbing work. That's all like being trained into a model that now plugs into like this humanoid robot. Could we not replace, like, would it not come for blue collar if you're pairing it with yeah. like the, the robot side of things? Well, most cars in most car factories, even the tests are built robotically. Mm -hmm. There's the assembly and so forth. Not everything, but that replaced human beings. Mm -hmm and to replace union workers, you know, yeah. high paid union jobs. So, um, yeah, I suppose that could be the case, but there's so much, uh, like decision-making and that you need to do when you're doing repair, like, oh, you look down and there's the floors rotting below. Oh, I have to go to Home Depot and, yeah. and buy, you know, parts from Home Depot to fix that, whatever. But there's just so much decision-making and expertise level. And, uh, you, it's really hard to, I mean, you can get some expertise stuff in AI, I suppose, but just knowledge just experience is just not there. And mm -hmm. so I, I think it writes a great country Western song. Um, maybe the, can it fix, can it fix, the, can it change the light bulbs by looking up at it and knowing which ones are bad? I don't, maybe, I don't think so right now. But right. if I were a script writer or someone in Hollywood, I would be concerned about it. You could, you could create an actor who doesn't exist. Yeah. Not a real person. You know? Yeah. And so good. So yeah. good. It's yeah. uncanny. And just sit, just sit there and tune it until you get it to do what you want it to do. You know, uh -huh. look at, examine a, an actor's face and see how it behaves. And so, yeah, it, there's th certain areas I think that it could, you know, warfare also do, being able to, um, here's, here's the thing that this is a great, just let me digress a little bit, talk about warfare because it's yeah. something that I've thought about, you know, right now um, you, you can uh, have a drone go in and do an attack. Right. Yeah. yeah. And 30 or 40 years ago, you would have to have a person go do that. Yeah. The commander who's a human being would have to say, Sergeant, take three of your guys out there and then destroy that, whatever it is, pillbox, mm -hmm. let's yeah. say. Uh -huh. And, but what's running through your mind is the commander's like, I might get these guys killed. I mean, uh -huh. they could die. Well, how am I going to feel about that? Right. Yeah. He's a human being. Of course, he's going to feel bad. With a drone, you're not thinking about that. You're just going to attack. Yeah. So it brings a whole another level of, of danger and warfare of escalating it because yeah. you're not risking people. You're risking a piece of hardware. Yeah. So where am I going with this? I, I think I think that, uh, you know, in terms of AI, we have similar types of, of issues like that. I mean, mm -hmm. um, a nefarious person could construct uh, um, uh, 
a political dialogue or something like that because it's just a robot doing it. Yeah. And by your example, doing the interview with, with an AI, Jaden Shaper, you know, would, would be, you know, I mean, you're not really risking anything. You're risking something for yourself, but you could have a, a you know, I guess I could, I'm going with that. It's just like it removes a human factor. Decision making is based on, and warfare is based on, you know, a lot of it's just how you feel about lives. You know, you, a, a general doesn't like to send people to their death, for sure. Uh -huh. You know, young men. And now with, with the, I mean, you've probably seen some of those videos from, from um, Ukraine where they're dropping yeah. mortar rounds. On, I mean, it's just, oh man. Yeah, that's so, rough. And I think, also something like touching on that is like it's uh it's kind of sketchy to me like ai and warfare because you look at different countries and they have different military doctrine right like for example we've seen russia is typically more willing to uh like in an invasion lose more of their troops per se um in, in certain maneuvers and there's just different countries that have like a different value and if they're training their own ai models integrated into war it just like i don't know to me it like it just feels kind of gross. Mm -hmm. But I mean, even for you, I mean, this is probably something you've thought a lot about, right? We have really big AI, uh, AI being integrated into weapons with like Palantir, for example, or even mm -hmm. right, one of your uh, previous co founders, Palmer, right, he's working Andrew. on Andrew, <laughs> yeah. right. And I'm sure like he has some I've seen just recently, he unveiled like a autonomous, you know, drone um, airplane, that's yeah. this stuff is all getting AI Furry. integrated into it. Yeah. Yeah. Fury rather. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know to, you know, I, just to, I can't tell you everything, but I've been approached by, uh, uh, the air force to help them with stuff. And right. uh, I, I'm, I'm a little bit on the fence on it. The problem with me is that, is that I, uh, I don't want to have a job. <laughs> right now. Although I would help them. I mean, it's the government. Yeah. Uh, I don't know to which level and in, in that product, uh, that he has AI integrated. He says it's completely autonomous. Uh -huh. um, maybe, I mean, that's a that's a lot of hardware to try to get done. He's been working on what, like eight, five years, six years. It seems yeah. like a lot of stuff to get done in a shorter period of time. I'm always wary of announcements like that. It's like, uh -huh. well, what does it really do? Uh -huh. You know, so, uh, but I I don't have a lot of comments on, on what his, you know, his stuff it does. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm skeptical. A lot of things I hear when I hear announcements like that. Uh -huh. If it's that good, you don't say anything about it. You know? Yeah, it's like interesting. You know, it's revealing, True. Revealing, revealing your your stuff to the formula, the other Formula One team. You know, yeah. You're telling Red Bull what you're, you know, you just don't say anything, although uh -huh. they probably know. So that's kind of <clears throat> what I think on that issue. You know, we, one of the things about uh, you know, like uh, GTA Five, Grand Theft Auto Five. You know that the yeah. If you played that, the entire uh, little country that you played in was created entirely in CAD on Autodesk by people. Really? Yeah, it was. Yeah, wow. I sit there and draw that in CAD. And I think it would be cool to be able to say to an AI engine, make a building with broken windows and graffiti on it, make it out of brick, make it 10 stories, and make smoke coming out of the top. And it just does the whole thing, including the shading and texturing for it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I that just have saw. Utility. I just saw a tool that's like that. It, it does 3D worlds based off of AI. And it's so interesting because it's got a little chat bot like chat GPT where it's like, you tell it what to do, it builds the world and you're like, okay, make the building taller. Okay, actually make a moat around it. Okay, like, and so yeah. it's like live editing. It's so fascinating. This is going to get into, yeah. um, this is going to get into like Oculus integrating this into Horizon Worlds and other things yeah. like that. I, I can't help but For think sure. um, it'll be so fascinating. That's the best you that's the best utility because the labor that goes in it. Also, you can have the, the game generate its own cities, each one very different from the other. Yeah. You know, as you go along and you play, it just automatically, based on tech script, the new the new structure, the new building that you run into. Or, you know, that's just, I think that's cool. And, yeah. You know, create monsters and tanks and all kinds of stuff. Mid-Journey, mid I mean, some of the stuff that's been done is, like I said, it's hellish. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, that's what, if you ask me, that's the best, this utility best for AI, for, for, for strategy it has to be designed, you know, it's, it's designed on a storyboard. Like you tell the story of how the, it's like a movie. If you tell the story of how the game is to unfold and how it's to play yeah. to the producer, you know, this is what the people that come with a, a game idea. It's like, basically it's like a sketch type thing. And they, okay. Granted, I haven't been around the area in, in, in 10 years, but that's basically how it's done it. And I got to it like. E3 or GDC or something, you see people doing a pitch, right? Uh -huh. um, and, and so this, the strategy is designed by a human being for entertainment. I, I'm, can AI design the game strategy? It would have to be based on previous strategies and what worked well.
but certainly mm-hmm. I think it could. You know, so it would be cool to have an AI engine generate an entire game. You could you could be a developer sitting in your house and say, you know, just make an entire game just by yeah. doing, doing descriptives. You know? Yeah. So, so fascinating. I think that's going to be a massive part of it is just this whole personalized yeah. angle. Movies, entertainment. Yeah. You can direct your own movie. You pick the yeah. actors that are in it. You pick like the script and the storyline. Like, come on, that's crazy. That's that's a really really good application. It could be an old its own industry, and you put yeah. them up on Netflix or something like that. On, yeah, on for that Netflix, but yeah, yeah, and the, and I mean, even help. people worrying that like AI replaces like those actors can get a royalty every time they're included in a certain movie, and maybe yeah. they have like personal moral things where like I don't do war movies or I don't do like they could like yeah. pick their criteria, but you can just kind of mix and match and build. I, I think that yeah. would be a, a powerful use case. Like movies, music. I mean, I've already heard some incredible Johnny Cash uh, AI songs that I was pretty blown yeah. away by. So yeah, I think it's there's so many incredible applications. Well, Jack, thank you so much for coming on the AI Chat Podcast today. I know this thing went way over. I'm sorry. I was just getting okay. too many incredible, uh, incredible insights from you. But uh, if people are interested in reaching out to you and finding more about what you're working on yeah. or um, anything else, what's the best way for them to uh, get in contact with you or, or see some of the things you're doing? Uh, probably through my assistant. The problem with me is I don't answer my emails. I see them go by and I go, I'll get to that. And I never do. <laughs> so she filters that stuff, not filters, but she, she like bugs yeah. me and I don't answer stuff. It's like what happened with you. So, so, uh, that's the best way. Um, and also LinkedIn, reach out on LinkedIn. I have okay. someone help me with that. So, but, and, uh, yeah, it's been a great talk and you, you're really good at this. I was pretty impressed. So thank you. Uh, Well, it's been amazing to the listeners. Thank you so much for tuning into the AI Chat podcast. Make sure to rate us wherever you get your podcasts and have an amazing rest of your day.